Hey everyone, this is Yukabuka and welcome to my home on YouTube. In this video, we will look at the kernel's key retention service and uh, we will start off by browsing through the documentation that we can find in the Linux source. And as we familiarize ourselves with the system, we will go through uh, the implementation of the subsystem as well. Uh, in this case, we can see that the uh, document has been split up into various sections. There is an overview, uh, there is SA Linux support and all that, and it ends with garbage collection. So let's take a quick look at the overview and let's read through that uh, in order to uh, understand what's being, uh, what's being conveyed. Uh, so first of all, we can see that every key that is present in the keys subsystem has a number of attributes. You have a serial number, you have a type, a description, information on who can access it, an expiry time, a payload, and a state. So a serial number is effectively a number that uniquely represents a key. It is what is returned to user space when uh, a key is created or a key is searched for. Uh, and you can see that it is represented by the type key serial underscore t. And if you look at the kernel source, you can see that key serial t is a type def for int32. Uh, so a signed 32-bit integer value. And then the next thing is a key type. Now a key type describes what kind of operations can be performed on a specific key. Uh, and there are about five or six types uh, within the Linux kernel. And it is interesting that user space cannot define uh, new types of keys. It should always be the kernel which does that. Um, it's also interesting to know that uh, when a specific type is removed, all the keys of that specific type will be invalidated. Uh, is there anything else? I, I guess that's pretty much it. And then the next one is the description. And the description is supposed to be a printable string representation. And it is also, in some cases, what is used to uh, locate a key when you search for it and then you have access control information such as the user id the group id and the permissions mask and so on you have an expiry time so you can set keys to expire at a specific time when the key is instantiated or you can set keys such that they don't expire a payload is effectively the data that is corresponding to a specific key and there is also a concept of a key ring which is effectively a directory which contains links to various keys. So the payload of a key ring is effectively links to other keys. Then finally you have a state uh, which is effectively one of these six values. Uh, a key can either be uninstantiated which means that the key exists but does not have any data attached. Right. Uh, so this line is a bit unclear uh, for me um, at this point, or when I first read it. Um, keys being requested from user space will be in the state. So I think this is a reference to uh, the callout functionality that the key subsystem has, but uh, at this point it's a bit unclear. Instantiated means that this is the normal state, a key is created, a payload is associated with it, that's it. There is also the concept of a negative key, where you have a key which has requested data from user space uh, and is sort of waiting on it. And at that point, while it's waiting on payload data from user space, it wants to throttle the requests that come from user space uh, as the key is not ready yet. So that's what a negative state 
means. Uh, expired keys are those which have lifetime set and the lifetime has been hit, which means it cannot be used anymore. A revoked key is one that has been uh, put into the state by user space. So the user space issues a request to revoke a specific key and the key is no more. It's probably done through the key CTL system call, but I'm not sure of that. And dead is when a key's type has been unregistered and as a result, all the keys of that specific type are set to dead. They also mention that when a key is in one of these states, they are waiting to be garbage collected. And as we saw initially, there is a later state or the last um, section of this document deals with garbage collection. Uh, finally, uh, uh, or in the, in the second section, we have something where they describe over here what a key service is. Uh, and a key service is basically either, or, or, or rather than a key service, they describe three specific key types. There are more key types in the kernel rather than, um, there are more than three key types in the Linux kernel, but these three are the ones that are being described here. Uh, a key ring effectively means that it contains a list of other, key, uh, other keys. Um, we discussed this briefly earlier. Uh, and then a user key ring is one where the description and the type are arbitrary blobs of data, right? And they can be created, updated, and read by user space and aren't intended for use by kernel services. All right. So this is a type of key where, which is meant for use by user space. So it's called user. Uh, the content is provided by the content, that is the description and the payload is provided by the user and it can be pro uh, read, in, uh, read out by the user as well. Uh, the third type is a logon key type, which means that the payload is arbitrary. Um, let's see, the, let's gro go through the description here. Uh, the payload is an arbitrary blob of data, fine. It is intended as a place to store secrets which are accessible to the kernel, but not to user space programs. Right. Right, and over here they say that it can be created and updated from user space, but it's readable only from kernel space. Okay, so that's the type of key logon refers to. It's one which can be created and updated from user space, but can only be read from kernel space. It's not very clear to me what the use case or what, what the scenario would be where you would want to use a logon kind of key. Uh, maybe it has something to do with, uh, well, logging onto the system, but it's, it's unclear to me at this point. Uh, another something that might be interesting is to note that we th they describe the description must be prefixed by a non-zero non length string that describes the key subclass. The, subca the subclass is separated by a colon. So effectively, keys which have type logon have a description of a particular format. First, they have a subclass, uh, and then they have a colon, and then they have the rest of the description. So that's it. Uh, and then over here, they describe uh, another property of how keyrings are used. Every process has three kinds of keyrings. You have a thread-specific one, you have a process-specific one, and you have a session-specific one. Now, the, thread the difference between these three keyrings is on whether the key rings are shared um, between threads of the process, between um, uh, parent and child of the process, and between uh, various sessions. That is, well, if it does an exec VE, will the key persist or not? So, in in the the thread specific key ring is well, it's it's like the name suggests, 
uh, it's only created when required um, it it is discarded when any sort of a fork or a clone or anything of that sort happens right so that way uh, every new thread will have its own key ring so it's exactly as the name suggests the process specific one means that if you do a clone fork or v fork it discards its key ring um, ex if you do an exec v that also discards the key ring right if you do the fork with a clone thread then they share the key ring right uh, so that's uh, a specific case but if you look at the name alone you can see that uh, a process specific key ring is uh, well one that is specific to a process a session specific one is persistent across all of these system calls clone fork exec view yada 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 and even when the latter executes a set uid or a set gid binary right so i guess a session refers to one where you are logged into the terminal and then you have a process that is running so every single process in that logged on session somehow uh, shares a key ring and that's what uh, this refers to right for so for example when you log in you have a bash shell and that has a specific key ring when the bash shell executes a command such as ls as a result of a fork that also shares the same key ring as the shell itself so everything you do as a result of a single um, or from within a single login shell should share the same session specific key ring right now they also say that you have an option to replace the current specific uh, the current session key ring uh, by issuing a PRCTL call with PR I, I'm assuming that this is a P, uh, flag to be used with the PRCTL uh, system call okay. and then finally you have a user specific uh, key ring so there is a user specific key ring and a default user session key ring they also mention that this specific session key ring has a link to the user specific key ring but these two lines are not very clear to me so I'm going to skip over that and maybe come back to it at a later point in time however for now let's just try and keep in mind that there are two kinds of key rings available to every user it's the user specific key ring and the default user session key ring okay and then over here they discuss how there are quotas um, which are tracked there are quotas for how many keys or uh, how much size worth of keys you can create uh, and that is what is being described here there are two ways to track quotas uh, one is based on the number of keys and the second is based on the size of the description and the payload that is the size of the key itself um, an interesting point is to note that the thread specific key rings and the process specific key rings are exempt from quotas and only the set uh, so it so these two are just not uh, counted towards a user's quota so I'm guessing the session specific key ring is definitely counted and then if there are any of these th these ones are probably counted as well these key rings and the keys associated with that are probably counted as well uh, yeah and if at some point you request a key and you've exceeded your quota you get the error of ev quote returned and then finally they say that there is a system call interface by which user space programs can manipulate keys and key rings there are three system calls there is add key there is a request key and there is key ctl so these are the three system calls and uh, we'll look at them in the documents below um, and then they say that there is also a kernel interface by which services can register types 
and search for keys. Now, if you remember what I said earlier, user space cannot request the kernel for new types. The kernel or various subsystems within the kernel request the key management, uh, request via the key management uh, interface the creation of new types. And finally, there is a way to search for keys from user space as well and to request a key that can't be. And there is a way for the kernel to call back to user space. Now, this is interesting uh, because in certain systems, uh, I think it's, um, it's either add key or request key. There is an argument which uh, is described as callout. I think it's easier if we can look at the code. Uh, if we go to, let's say, one of these system calls, uh, maybe this one. Or this one. Yes, you can see that request for the request key system call, there is something called callout info. Now, this is a string that will be used as an argument to a user space binary which will be invoked from within the kernel. Right? So, we'll look into all of that in detail later on, but just so you know what we're dealing with. And finally, it says that there is an optional file system to view the uh, key database. I wonder if this refers to the proc interface because there is there are a few proc files that can be used to view and see information about uh, the keys that are present in the system. And there are also a few uh, sysctl uh, values by which you can uh, change the quota of a particular user and so on. So that's it for this video. Um, look out for the next one.